The UCC Connection Free Yourself from Legal Tyranny September 22, 1991 Forward This is a slightly condensed, casually paraphrased transcript of tapes of a seminar given in 1990 by Howard Freeman. It was prepared to make available the knowledge and experience of Mr. Freeman in his search for an accessible and understandable explanation of the confusing state of the government and the courts. It should be helpful to those who may have difficulty learning from such lectures or those who want to develop a deeper understanding of this information without having to listen to three or four hours of recorded material. The frustration many Americans feel about our judicial system can be overwhelming and often frightening and, as most fear, is based on lack of understanding or knowledge. Those of us who have chosen a path out of bondage and into liberty are faced eventually with the seemingly tyrannical power of some governmental agency and the mystifying and awesome power of the courts. We have been taught that we must get a good lawyer, but that is becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible. If we are defending ourselves from the government, we find that the lawyers quickly take our money and then tell us, as the ship is sinking, quote, I can't help you with that. I'm an officer of the court, unquote. Ultimately, the only way for us to have even a, quote, snowball's chance, unquote, is to understand the rules of the game and to come to an understanding of the true nature of the law. The lawyers have established a secured and virtual monopoly over this area of human knowledge by implying that the subject is just too difficult for the average person to understand, and by creating a separate vocabulary out of English words of otherwise common usage. While it may at times seem hopelessly complicated, it is not that difficult to grasp. Are lawyers really as smart as they would have us believe? Besides, anyone who has been through a legal battle against the government with the aid of a lawyer has come to realize that lawyers learn about procedure, not about law. Mr. Freeman admits that he is not a lawyer, and as such, he has a way of explaining law to us that puts it well within our reach. Consider also that the framers of the Constitution wrote in language simple enough that the people could understand, specifically so that it would not have to be interpreted. So, again, we find, as in many other areas of life, that, quote, the buck stops here, unquote. It is we who must take the responsibility for finding and putting to good use the truth. It is we who must claim and defend our God-given rights and our freedom from those who would take them from us. It is we who must protect ourselves, our families, and our posterity from the inevitable intrusion into our lives by those who live parasitically off the labor, skill, and talents of others. To these ends, Mr. Freeman offers a simple, hopeful explanation of our plight and a peaceful method of dealing with it. Please take note that this lecture represents one chapter in the book of his understanding, which he is always refining, expanding, and improving. It is, as all bits of wisdom are, a point of departure from which to begin our journey into understanding, that we all might be able to pass on to others greater knowledge and hope, and to God, the gift of lives lived in peace, freedom and praise. The UCC Connection quote, 
I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Introduction When I beat the IRS, I use Supreme Court decisions. If I had tried to use these in court, I would have been convicted. I was involved with a patriot group and I studied Supreme Court cases. I concluded that the Supreme Court had declared that I was not a person required to file an income tax, that the tax was an excise tax on privileges granted by the government. So I quit filing and paying income tax, and it was not long before they came down on me with a heavy hand. They issued a notice of deficiency which had such a fantastic sum on it that the biggest temptation was to go in with their letter and say, quote, where in the world did you ever get that figure, unquote. They claimed I owed them some $60,000. But even if I had been paying taxes, I never had that much money, so how could I have owed them that much? Never argue the amount of deficiency. <clears throat> Fortunately, I had been given just a little bit of information. Never argue the facts in a tax case. If you're not required to file, what do you care whether they say you owe $60 or $60,000? If you're not required to file, the amount doesn't matter. Don't argue the amount. That is a fact issue. In most instances, when you get a notice of deficiency, it is usually for some fantastic amount. The IRS wants you to run in and argue about the amount. The minute you say, quote, I don't owe that much, unquote, you have agreed that you owe them something, and you have given them jurisdiction. Just don't be shocked at the amount on a notice of deficiency, even if it is ten million dollars. If the law says that you are not required to file or pay tax, the amount doesn't matter. By arguing the amount, they will just say that you must go to tax court and decide what the amount is to be. By the time you get to tax court, the law issues are all decided. You're only there to decide how much you owe. They will not listen to arguments of law. So, I went to see the agent and told him that I wasn't required to file. He said, quote, you are required to file, Mr. Freeman, unquote. But I had all these Supreme Court cases, and I started reading them to him. He said, I don't know anything about law, Mr. Freeman, but the, co the code says that you are required to file and you're going to pay that amount or you're going to go to tax court. I thought that someone there ought to know something about law, so I asked to talk to his superior. I went to him and I got out my Supreme Court cases and he wouldn't listen to them. Quote, I don't know anything about law, Mr. Freeman, unquote. Finally, I got to the problems resolution officer. And he said the same thing. He said that the only person above him was the district director. So I went to see him. By the time I got to his office, they had phoned ahead, and his secretary said he was out. But I heard someone in his office, and I knew he was in there. I went down the elevator, around the corner, to the federal building and into Senator Simpson's office. There was a girl sitting there at a desk, and she asked if she could help me. I told her my problem. I said that I really thought the district director was up there. I asked her to call the IRS and tell them that it was Senator Simpson's office calling, and to ask if the district director was in. I said, if you get him on the phone, tell him that you are from the senator's office, and you have a person whom you are sending over to speak to him. If he is, can he wait just five minutes? His secretary met me when I came in and said, Mr. Freeman, you're so lucky. The director just arrived. 
The director was very nice and offered me coffee and cookies and we sat and talked. So he asked me what I wanted to talk to him about. Now, if you ever have someone say to you, I'm from the government and I'm here to do you a favor, watch out. But we can turn that around and approach them the same way. So I said, I thought you ought to know that there are agents working for you who are writing letters over your name that you wouldn't agree with. Do you read all the mail that goes out of this office over your signature? The director said, Oh, I couldn't read everything. It goes out of here by the bag full. That's what I thought. I said, there are some of your agents writing letters which contradict the decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States. And they're not doing it over their name. They're doing it over your name. He was very interested to hear about it and asked if I had any examples. I just happened to have some with me, so I got them out and presented them to him. He thought it was very interesting and asked if I could leave this information with him, which I did. He said he would look it over and contact me in three days. Three days later, he called me up and said, I'm sure, Mr. Freeman, that you will be glad to know that your notice of deficiency has been withdrawn. We've determined that you're not a person required to file. Your file is closed and you will hear no more from us. I haven't heard another word from them since. That was in 1980 and I haven't filed since 1969. The Supreme Court on Trial I thought sure I had the answer, but when a friend got charged with willful failure to file an income tax, he asked me to help him. I told him that they have to prove that he willfully failed to file, and I suggested that he should put me on the witness stand. He should ask me if I spoke at a certain time and place in Scott's Bluff, and did I see him in the audience. He should then ask me what I spoke of that day. When I got on the stand, I brought out all of the Supreme Court cases I had used with the district director. I thought I would be lucky to get a sentence or two out before the judge cut me off, but I was reading whole paragraphs, and the judge didn't stop me. I read one and then another and so on. And finally, when I had read just about as much as I thought I should, the judge called a recess of the court. I told Bob I thought we had it made. There was just no way that they could rule against him after all that testimony. So we relaxed. The prosecution presented its case and he decided to rest his defense on my testimony, which showed that he was not required to file and that the Supreme Court had upheld his position. The prosecution then presented its closing statements and we were just sure that he had won. But at the very end, the judge spoke to the jury and told them, you will decide the facts of this case and I will give you the law. The law required this man to file an income tax form. You decide whether or not he filed it. What a shock! The jury convicted him. Later, some of the members of the jury said, What could we do? The man had admitted that he had not filed the form. So we had to convict him. As soon as the trial was over, I ran around to the judge's office, and he was just coming in through his back door. I said, Judge, by what authority do you overturn the standing decisions of the United States Supreme Court? You sat on the bench while I read that case law. Now, how do you, a district court judge, have the authority to overturn decisions of the Supreme Court? He says, oh, those were old decisions. I said, those are standing decisions. They have never been overturned. I don't care how old they are. You have no right to overturn a standing decision of the United States Supreme Court in a district court. Public law versus public policy. He said, name any decision of the Supreme Court after 1938 
and I'll honor it. But all the decisions you read were prior to 1938, and I don't honor those decisions. I asked, what happened in 1938? He said, prior to 1938, the Supreme Court was dealing with public law. Since 1938, the Supreme Court has dealt with public policy. The charge that Mr. S. was being tried for is a public policy statute, not public law. And those Supreme Court cases do not apply to public policy. I asked him what happened in 1938. He said he already had said too much. He wasn't going to tell me anymore. 1938 and the Erie Railroad. Well, I began to investigate. I found that 1938 was the year of the Erie, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins case of the Supreme Court. It was also the year the courts claimed they blended law with equity. I read the Erie Railroad case. A man had sued the Erie Railroad for damage damages when he was struck by a board sticking out of a box car as he walked along beside the tracks. The district court had decided on the basis of commercial or negotiable, ne negotiable instruments law that this man was not under any contract with the Erie Railroad and therefore he had no standing to sue the company. Under the common law, he was damaged and he would have had the right to sue. This overturned a standing decision of over 100 years. Swift versus Tyson in 1840 was a similar case and the decision of the Supreme Court was that in any case of this type the court would judge the case on the common law of the state where the incident occurred. In this case Pennsylvania. But in the Erie Railroad case the Supreme Court ruled that all federal cases will be judged under the negotiable instruments law. There would be no more decisions based on the common law at the federal level. So here we find the blending of law with equity. This was a puzzle to me. As I put these new pieces together I determined that all our courts since 1938 were merchant law courts and not common law courts. There were still some pieces of the puzzle missing. A friend of the court. Fortunately, I made a friend of a judge. Now, you won't make friends with a judge if you go into a court like a wolf in black sheep country. You must approach him as though you are the sheep, and he is the wolf. If you go into court as a wolf, you make demands, and you tell the judge what the law is, and how he had better uphold the law, or else. Remember the verse. I send you out as sheep in wolf's country. Be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. We have to go into court and be wise and harmless and not make demands. We must play a little dumb and ask a lot of questions. Well, I asked a lot of questions and I boxed the judge into a corner where they had to give me a victory or admit what they didn't want to admit. I won the case. And on the way out, I had to go stop by the clerk's office to get some papers. One of the judges stopped and said, You're an interesting man, Mr. Freeman. If you're ever in town, stop by. And if I'm not sitting on a case, we'll visit. America is bankrupt. Later, when I went to visit the judge, I told him of my problem with the Supreme Court cases dealing with public policy rather than public law. He said, in 1938, all the higher judges, the top attorneys, and the U.S. attorneys were called into a secret meeting, and this is what they were told. America is a bankrupt nation. It is owned completely by its creditors. The creditors own the Congress, they own the executive, they own the judiciary, and they own all the state governments. Take silent judicial notice of this fact, but never reveal it open, openly. Your court is operating in an admiralty jurisdiction, 
call it anything you want, but do not call it Admiralty. Admiralty Courts. The reason they cannot call it Admiralty Jurisdiction is that your defense would be quite different in Admiralty Jurisdiction from your defense under the common law. In Admiralty, there is no court which has jurisdiction unless there is a valid international contract in dispute. If you know it is Admiralty Jurisdiction and they have admitted on the record that you are in an Admiralty Court, you can demand that the International Maritime Contract to which you are supposedly a party and which you supposedly have breached be placed into evidence. No court has Admiralty slash Maritime Jurisdiction unless there is a valid International Maritime Contract that has been breached. So, you say, just innocently like a lamb, well, I never knew that I got involved with an international maritime contract, so I deny that such a contract exists. If this court is taking jurisdiction in admiralty, then place the contract in evidence, so that I may challenge the validity of the contract. What they would have to do is place the national debt into evidence. They would have to admit that the international bankers own the whole nation and that we are their slaves. Not expedient. But the bankers said it is not expedient at this time to admit that they own everything and could foreclose on every nation of the world. The reason they don't want to tell everyone that they own everything is that there are still too many privately owned guns. There are uncooperative armies and other military forces. So until they can gradually consolidate all armies into a world army and all courts into a single world court, it is not expedient to admit the jurisdiction of the courts are operating under. When we understand these things we realize that there are certain secrets they don't want to admit and we can use this to our benefit. Jurisdiction. The Constitution of the United States mentions three areas of jurisdiction in which the courts may operate. Common law. Common law is based on God's law. Anytime someone is charged under the common law, there must be a damaged party. You are free under the common law to do anything you please, as long as you do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. You have a right to make a fool of yourself, provided you do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. The common law does not allow for any government action which prevents a man from making a fool of himself. For instance, <clears throat> when you cross over state lines in most states, you will see a sign which says, Buckle your seatbelts. It's the law. This cannot be common law. Because who would you injure if you did not buckle up? Nobody. This would be compelled performance, but common law cannot compel performance. Any violation of common law is a criminal act, and it is punishable. Equity law. Equity law is law which compels performance. It compels you to perform the, to the exact letter of any contract that you are under. So if you have compelled performance, there must be a contract somewhere. And if you are being compelled to perform under the obligation of the contract. Now, this can only be a civil action, not criminal. In equity jurisdiction, you cannot be tried criminally. But you can be compelled to perform to the letter of a contract. If you then refuse to perform as directed by the court, you can be charged with contempt of court, which is a criminal action. Are your seatbelt laws equity laws? No, they are not, because you cannot be penalized or punished for not keeping to the letter of a contract. Admiralty slash maritime law. This 
is a civil jurisdiction of compelled performance, which also has criminal penalties for not adhering to the letter of the contract. But this only applies to international contracts. Now, we can see what jurisdiction the seatbelt laws and all traffic laws, building codes, ordinances, tax codes, etc. are under. Whenever there is a penalty for failure to perform, such as willful failure to file, that is admiralty slash maritime law, and there must be a valid international contract in force. However, the courts don't want to admit that they are operating under admiralty slash maritime jurisdiction, so they took the international law or law merchant and adopted it into our codes. That is what the Supreme Court decision in the Erie Railroad case that the decisions will be based on commercial law or business law and that it will have criminal penalties associated with it. Since they were instructed not to call it admiralty jurisdiction, they call it statutory jurisdiction. Courts of Contract you may ask how we got into this situation where we can be charged with failure to wear seat belts and be fined for it. Isn't the judge sworn to uphold the Constitution? Yes, he is. But you must understand that the Constitution in Article 1, Section 10 gives us the unlimited right to contract as long as we do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. Contracts are enforceable. And the Constitution gives two jurisdictions where contracts can be enforced, equity and admiralty. But we find them being enforced in statutory jurisdiction. This is the embarrassing part for the courts, but we can use this to box the judges into a corner in their own courts. We will cover this more later. Contracts must be voluntary. Under the common law, Every contract must be entered into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally by both parties, or it is void and unenforceable. These are characteristics of a common law contract. There is another characteristic. It must be based on substance. For example, contracts used to read, for one dollar and other valuable considerations, I will paint your house, etc. This was a valid contract. The dollar was a genuine silver dollar. Now, suppose you wrote a contract that said, for one Federal Reserve note and other considerations, I will paint your house. And suppose, for example, I painted your house the wrong color. Could you go into a common law court and get justice? No, you could not. You see, a Federal Reserve note is a colorable one dollar and it has no substance and in a common law jurisdiction that contract would be unenforceable colorable money colorable courts the word colorable means something that appears to be genuine but is not maybe it looks like a dollar and maybe it spends like a dollar but if it is not redeemable for lawful money which is silver and gold it is colorable if a Federal Reserve note is used in a contract, then the contract becomes a colorable contract. And colorable contracts must be enforced under a colorable jurisdiction. <clears throat> so, by creating Federal Reserve notes, the government had to create a jurisdiction to cover the kinds of contracts which use them. We now have what is called statutory jurisdiction, which is not a genuine admiralty jurisdiction. It is colorable admiralty jurisdiction. The judges are enforcing it because we are using colorable money. Colorable admiralty is now known as statutory jurisdiction. Let's see how we got under this statutory jurisdiction. Uniform Commercial Code The government set up a colorable law system to fit the colorable currency 
It used to be called the Law Merchant or the Law of Redeemable Instruments because it dealt with paper which was redeemable in something of substance. But once Federal Reserve notes had become unredeemable, there had to be a system of law which was completely colorable from start to finish. This system of law was codified as the Uniform Commercial Code and has been adopted in every state. This is colorable law and it is used in all the courts. I explained one of the keys earlier which is that the country is bankrupt and we have no rights. If the, matter, or if the master says jump then the slave had better jump because the master has the right to cut off his head. As slaves we have no rights but the creditors slash masters had to cover that up so they created a system of law called the Uniform Commercial Code. This colorable jurisdiction under the Uniform Commercial Code is the next key to understanding what has happened. Contract or Agreement One difference between common law and the Uniform Commercial Code is that in common law Contracts must be entered into one knowingly, two voluntarily, and three intentionally. Under the UCC, this is not so. First of all, contracts are unnecessary. Under this new law, agreements can be binding. And if you only exercise the benefits of an agreement, it is presumed or implied that you intend to meet the obligations associated with those benefits. If you accept a benefit offered by government, then you are obligated to follow to the letter each and every statute involved with that benefit. The method has been to get everybody exercising a benefit, and they don't even have to tell the people what the benefit is. Some people think it is the driver's license, the marriage license, or the birth certificate, etc. I believe it's none of these. Compelled Benefits I believe the benefit being used is that we have been given the privilege of discharging debt with limited liability instead of paying debt. When we pay a debt, we give substance for substance. If I buy a quart of milk with a silver dollar, that dollar bought the milk, and the milk bought the dollar, substance for substance. But if I use a Federal Reserve note to buy the milk, I have not paid for it. There's no substance in the Federal Reserve note. It is worthless paper, given in exchange for something of substantive value. Congress offers us this benefit. Debt money created by the federal United States can be spent all over the continental United States. It will be legal tender for all debts, public and private. And the limited liability is that you cannot be sued for not paying your debts. So, now they've said, we're going to help you out and you can just discharge your debts instead of paying your debts. When we use this colorable money to discharge our debts, we cannot use a common law court. We can only use a colorable court. We are completely under the jurisdiction of the Uniform Commercial Code. We are using non-redeemable, negotiable instruments and we are discharging debt rather than paying debt. Remedy and Recourse Every system of civilized law must have two characteristics, remedy and recourse. Remedy is a way to get out from under that law. The recourse is if you have been damaged under the law, you can recover your loss. The common law, the law of merchants, and even the uniform commercial code all have remedy and recourse, but for a long time we could not find it. If you go to a law library and ask to see the Uniform Commercial Code, 
they will show you a shelf of books completely filled with the Uniform Commercial Code. When you pick up one volume and start to read it, it will seem to have been intentionally written to be confusing. It took us a long time to discover where the remedy and recourse are found in the UCC. They're found right in the first volume at 1-207 and 1-103. Remedy. The making of a valid reservation of rights preserves whatever rights the person then possesses and prevents the loss of such rights by application of Congress of waiver, I'm sorry, by application of concepts of waiver or estoppel. That's UCC 1-207.7. It is important to remember that when we go into court that we are in a commercial, international jurisdiction. If we go into court and say, I demand my constitutional rights, the judge will most likely say, you mention the Constitution again, and I'll find you in contempt of court. Then we don't understand how, we can, how he can do that. Hasn't he sworn to uphold the Constitution? The rule here is, you cannot be charged under one jurisdiction and defend under another. For example, if the French government came to you and asked where you filed your French income tax in a certain year, do you go to the French government and say, I demand my constitutional rights? No. The proper answer is, the law doesn't apply to me. I'm not a Frenchman. You must make your reservation of rights under the jurisdiction in which you are charged, not under some other jurisdiction. So, in a UCC court, you must claim your reservation of rights under the UCC 1-207. UCC 1-207 goes on to say, when a waivable right or claim is involved, the failure to make a reservation thereof causes the loss of the right and bars its assertion at a later date. And that's UCC 1-207.9. You have to make your claim known early. Further, it says, the sufficiency of the reservation. Any expression indicating <clears throat> an intention to reserve rights is sufficient, such as, in quotes, without prejudice, and that's UCC 1-207.4. Whenever you sign any legal paper that deals with Federal Reserve notes in any way, shape, or matter, under your signature right, without prejudice, UCC 1-207.2. This reserves your rights. You can show at 1-207.4 that you have sufficiently reserved your rights. It is very important to understand just what this means. For example, one man who used this in regard to a traffic ticket was asked by the judge just what he meant by writing, in quotes, without prejudice, UCC 1-207, unquote, on his statement to the court. He had not tried to understand the concepts involved. He only wanted to use it to get out of the ticket. He did not know what it meant. When the judge asked him what he meant by signing in that way, he told the judge that he was not prejudiced against anyone. The judge knew that the man had no idea what it meant, and he lost the case. You must know what it means. 
Without prejudice, UCC 1-207. When you use without prejudice UCC 1-207, in connection with your signature, you are saying, I reserve my right not to be compelled to perform under any contract or commercial agreement that I did not enter knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. And furthermore, I do not accept the liability of the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or commercial agreement. What is the compelled performance of an unrevealed commercial agreement? When you use Federal Reserve notes instead of a silver dollar, is it voluntary? No. There's no lawful money. So you have to use Federal Reserve notes. You have to accept the benefit. The government has given you the benefit to discharge your debts with limited liability, and you don't have to pay your debts. How nice they are. But if you did not reserve your rights under 1-207.7, you are compelled to accept the benefit, and therefore obligated to obey every statute, ordinance, and regulation of the government at all levels of the government, federal, state, and local. If you understand this, you will be able to explain it to the judge when he asks. He will ask, so be prepared to explain it to the court. You will also need to understand UCC 1-103. Three, the argument and recourse. If you want to understand this fully, go to a law library and photocopy these two sections from the UCC. It is important to get the Anderson 3 edition. Some of the law libraries will only have the West publishing version, and it is very difficult to understand. In Anderson, it is broken down with decimals into ten parts and, most importantly, it is written in plain English. Recourse The recourse appears in the Uniform Commercial Code at 1-103.6, which says, The code is complementary to the common law which remains in force, except where displaced by the code. A statute should be construed in harmony with the common law unless there is a clear legislative intent to abrogate the common law. This is the argument we use in court. The code recognizes the common law. If it did not recognize the common law, the government would have had to admit that the United States is bankrupt and is completely owned by its creditors. But it is not expedient to admit this, so the code was written so as not to abolish the common law entirely. Therefore, if you had made a sufficient, timely, and explicit reservation of your rights at 1-207, you may then insist that the statutes be construed in harmony with the common law. If the charge is a traffic ticket, you may demand that the court produce the injured person who has filed a verified complaint. If, for example, you were charged with failure to buckle your seatbelt, you may ask the court who was injured as a result of your failure to buckle up. However, if the judge won't listen to you and just moves ahead with the case, then you'll want to read to him the last sentence of 1-103.6, which states, The code cannot be read to preclude a common law action. Tell the judge, Your Honor, <clears throat> I can sue you under the common law 
for violating my right under the Uniform Commercial Code. I have a remedy under the UCC to reserve my rights under the common law. I have exercised the remedy and now you must construe this statute in harmony with the common law. To be in harmony with the common law you must come forth with a damaged party. If the judge insists on proceeding with the case just act confused and ask this question. Let me see if I understand your honor. Has this court made a legal determination that sections 1-207 and 1-103 of the Uniform Commercial Code, which is the system of law you are operating under, are not valid law before this court? Now, the judge is in a jam. How can the court throw out one part of the code and uphold another? If he answers yes, then you say, I put this court on notice that I am appealing your legal determination. Of course, the higher court will uphold the code on appeal. The judge knows this, so once again you've boxed him into a corner. Practical Application Traffic Court Just so we can understand how this whole process works, let's look at a court situation such as a traffic violation. Assume you ran through a yellow light and a policeman gave you a traffic ticket. One, the first thing you want to do is to delay the action at least three weeks. This you can do by being pleasant and cooperative with the officer. Explain to him that you are very busy and ask if he could please set your court appearance for about three weeks away. At this point we need to remember the government's trick. I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Now we want to use this approach with them. Number two, the next step is to go to the clerk of the traffic court and to say, I believe it would be helpful if I talk to you because I want to save the government some money. This will get his attention. I'm undoubtedly going to appeal this case. As you know, in an appeal I have to have a transcript. But the traffic court doesn't have a court reporter. It would be a waste of taxpayers' money to run me through this court and then to have to give me a trial de novo in a court of record. I do need a transcript for appealing and to save the government some money, maybe you could schedule me to appear in a court of record. You can show the date on the ticket and the clerk will usually agree that there is plenty of time to schedule your trial for a court of record. Now, your first appearance is in a court of record and not in a traffic court where there is no record. When you get into court, there will be a court reporter there who records every word the judge speaks. So the judge is much more careful in a court of record. You will be in a much better situation there than in a traffic court. If there is no record, the judge can say whatever he wants. He can call you all sorts of names and tell you that you have no rights and so on, and deny it all later. Number three, when you get into court, the judge will read the charges. Driving through a yellow light or whatever, and this is a violation of ordinance XYZ. He will ask, do you understand the charge against you? Number four, well, Your Honor, there's a question I would like to ask before I can make a plea of innocent or guilty. I think it could be answered if I could put the officer on the stand for a moment and ask him a few short questions. Judge, I don't see why not. Let's swear the officer in and have him take the stand. Number five, is this the instrument that you gave me? handing him the traffic citation officer yes this is a copy of it the judge has the other portion of it where did you get my address that you wrote 
on that citation? Officer. Well, I got it from your driver's license. Handing the officer your driver's license, say, Is this the document you copied my name and address from? The officer. Yes, this is where I got it. While you've got that in your hand, would you read the signature that's on the license? The officer reads the signature. While you're there, would you read into record what it says under the signature? The officer. It says, without prejudice, UCC 1-207. The judge. Let me see that license. He looks at it and turns to the officer. You didn't notice this printing under the signature on this license when you copied his name and address onto the ticket? Officer. Oh, no. I was just getting the address. I didn't look down there. Judge. You're not a very observant as an officer. Therefore, I'm afraid I cannot accept your testimony in regards to the facts of this case. The case is dismissed. Number six. In this case, the judge found a convenient way out. He could say that the officer was not observant enough to be a reliable witness. He did not want to admit the real nature of the jurisdiction of his court. Once it was in the record that you had written, without prejudice, UCC 1-207 on your license, the judge knew he would have to admit that. A. You had reserved your common law rights under the UCC. B. You had won it sufficiently by writing, without prejudice, UCC 1-207 on your driver's license. C. The statute would now have to be read in harmony with the common law, and the common law says the statute exists, but there's no injured party. And D. Since there's no injured party or complaining witness, the court has no jurisdiction under the common law. Number seven. If the judge tries to move ahead and try the facts of the case, then you'll want to ask him the following question. Your Honor, let me understand this correctly. Has this court made a legal determination that it has authority under the jurisdiction that it is operating under to ignore two sections of the Uniform Commercial Code which have been called to its attention? If he says yes, tell him that you put the court on notice that you will appeal that legal determination and that if you are damaged by his actions, you will sue him in a common law action under the jurisdiction of the UCC. This will work just as well with the inter Internal Revenue Service. In fact, we can use the UCC with the IRS before we get into court. Using the code with the IRS. If the IRS sends you a notice of deficiency, this is called a presentment in the Uniform Commercial Code. A presentment in the UCC is very similar to the common law. First, we must understand just how this works in the common law. Suppose I get a man's name from a phone book, someone I've never met, and I send him a bill or invoice on nice letterhead which says, for services rendered $10,000. I send him this by certified mail to him at the address taken from the phone book. The man has to sign for it before he can open it. So. I get a receipt that he received it. When he opens it, he finds an invoice for $10,000 and the following statement. If you have any questions concerning this bill or the services rendered, you have 30 days to make your questions or objections known. Of course, he's never heard of me, so he just throws the bill away and assumes that I'm confused or crazy. At the end of 30 days, I go to court and get a default judgment against him. 
he received a bill for $10,000, was given 30 days to respond. He failed to object to it or ask any questions about it. Now, he has defaulted on the bill and I can lawfully collect the $10,000. That's common law. The UCC works on the same principle. The minute you get a notice of deficiency from the IRS, you return it immediately with a letter that says, The presentment above is dishonored. Print your name has reserved all of his or her rights under the Uniform Commercial Code at UCC 1-207. This should be all that is necessary, and there is nothing more that they can do. In fact, I recently helped someone in Arizona who received a notice of deficiency. The man sent a letter such as this, dishonoring the presentment. The IRS wrote back that they could not make a determination at that office, but were turning it over to the Collections Department. A letter was attached from the Collections Department which said they were sorry for the inconvenience they had caused him and that the notice of deficiency had been withdrawn. So you can see that if it is handled properly these things are easily resolved. Impending Bankruptcy On my way here I had a chance to visit with the Governor of Wyoming. He is very concerned that if he runs for office this November that there won't be a state of Wyoming at the end of four years. He believes that the international bankers might foreclose on the nation and officially admit that they own the whole world. They could round up everybody in the state capitol building, put them in an internment camp and hold them indefinitely. They may give them a trial or they may not. They will do whatever they want. As I explained earlier, it has not been expedient to foreclose on the nation until they could get everything ready. This is where the Federal Emergency Management Agency comes in. It has been put in place without anyone really noticing it. FEMA FEMA, or the Federal Emergency management agency has been designed for when America is officially declared bankrupt, which would be a national emergency. It is a national emergency. In a national emergency, all constitutional rights and all law that previously existed would be suspended. FEMA has created large concentration camps where they would put anyone who might cause trouble for the orderly plan and process of the new regime to take over the nation. <clears throat> Even a governor could be thrown into one of these internment camps and kept there indefinitely. This is all in place now and they're just waiting to declare a national emergency. Then even state governments could be dissolved. Anybody who might oppose the new regime could be imprisoned until a new set of laws could be written and a new government set up. The governor knows all this and he's very concerned. He doesn't want to be in office when all this happens. I visited with him and told him that there are certain actions we could take right now. I think we should consider the fact that according to the Uniform Commercial Code, Wyoming is an accommodation party to the national debt. To understand this, we must realize that there are two separate entities known as the United States. The Rothschild Influence When America was founded, the Rothschilds were very unhappy because it was founded on the common law. The common law is based on substance, and this substance is mentioned in the Constitution as gold or silver. America is a constitutional republic, that is, a union of states under the Constitution. When Congress was working for the republic, the only thing it could borrow was gold or silver, 
and the Rothschild banks did not loan gold or silver. Naturally, they did not like this new government. The Rothschilds had to deal with the King of England, had a deal with the King of England. He would borrow paper and agree to repay it in gold. But these United States with their constitution were an obstacle to them, and it was much to the Rothschilds' advantage to get the colonies back under the king. So the Rothschilds financed the War of 1812 to bring America back under England. Of course, that didn't work, so they had to find another way. The flaw in the Constitution. Two nations in one. It was around the time of the American Civil War that they discovered a flaw in the Constitution. The flaw was Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Remember that there are two nations called United States. What is a nation? See if you would agree to this definition. Whenever you have a governing body, have a prescribed territory containing a body of people, is that a nation? Yes. We have a governing body in the Republic, a three-branch government. They are the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches with a constitution. There is a prescribed territory containing a body of people. This is a constitutional republic. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 gave Congress, which is the legislative branch of the three-branch government, exclusive rule over a given territory known as the District of Columbia, containing a body of people. Here we have a nation within a nation. This is a legislative democracy within a constitutional republic. When Congress was a part of the Constitutional Republic, it had the obligation of providing a medium of exchange for us. Its duty was to coin gold or silver. Anyone who had a piece of gold or silver could bring it in and have it freely minted into coin. This was the medium of exchange for the Republic. But in the legislative democracy over Washington, D.C., Congress is not limited by the Constitution. Congress has exclusive rule over the District of Columbia. The legislators can make the law by a majority vote. That makes it a democracy. They have the authority to have administrative agents to enforce their own law. And they have courts in the legislative branch of the government to try their own law. Here we have the legislator legislature making the law, enforcing the law, and trying the law, all within the one branch of government. This is a one branch government within a three branch government. Under the three branch government, the Congress passes law which has to be in harmony with the Constitution. The executive enforces the law passed by the Congress, and the judiciary tries the law pursuant to the Constitution. The three-branch constitutional republic and the one-branch legislative democracy are both called the United States. One is the federal United States, and the other is the continental United States.